When Intel released the Thunderbolt 3 specification, it was marketed as the fastest way to externally connect devices to your computer. That got me excited as this opened the potential for using PCI Express capture cards on laptops via external Thunderbolt enclosures. While that actually worked great in many different tests that I run, once I started moving on to 4K capture, I started realizing that I was hitting bandwidth limits far lower than the advertised max speed of 40 gigabytes per second. This honestly won't matter for most setups, but anybody trying to do 4K60 capture with uncompressed colors won't be able to do it, and if you're trying to run a modern graphics card externally, you might run into issues there as well. So come join me while I show how I came to these conclusions, and maybe we could figure this out together. Okay, before we begin, I want to make sure I'm very clear that this possible bandwidth limitation would only affect a very small percentage of Thunderbolt users. If you're using something like an external network USB dock that's connected to Thunderbolt, it'll be completely and totally fine. And even video capture up to 4K60, 422, or below that at 444 colors should also work fine, provided the rest of your system is fast enough to keep up with it, of course. The purpose of this video is really just to get a very clear understanding of how much bandwidth can be passed through Thunderbolt for situations exactly like I described, or for people who want to run external graphics cards for gaming over Thunderbolt. And the only other thing I want to note before we begin is what I'm showing is a recreation of the testing that I've been doing over the past year. So I'll be doing the testing in real time to show you exactly what it's done and exactly what the test results are. But every time I've done this over the past year, I got the same results. I've used multiple pieces of hardware. I have dragged friends from all over the planet in to help me on this one and double check my results. So if you see something in there like, oh, maybe you should just check the cable. I did. Please keep the comments coming because I always learn from you all, but I just want to let you know, rest assured, I didn't have a test case of two and come to this conclusion. There is a lot more to it. But anyway, let's just jump in and walk you step by step through how I figured all this out. In order to run these tests, we're going to be using the Mr. FPGA project outputting direct video, meaning that it's going to run the Super Nintendo core outputting the same resolution an original console would. And the reason I'm using this is because the 240p test suite has a counter designed for exactly these type of measurements. Then we're going to be running it through a prototype 4K scaler that should take that original image and send it to 4K60 with uncompressed colors in the full digital realm. But before we test capture, we're going to want to test directly onto a monitor because I want to absolutely guarantee that there's no hiccups in this setup. So we're going to just be connecting the scaler directly to a monitor, recording footage with this camera and counting the frames that go forward. Here's footage I shot with my GH5 camera pointed at my monitor that's meant to demonstrate that the sources that we're using, the Mr. and that 4K scaler, are actually drawing 60 full frames per second. And I have Media Player Classic Home Cinema, which is usually my go-to for video playback, but I want to highlight a problem with this and some other software that you're going to want to avoid. This software claims that if you hold the control key down and hit the right arrow, that it will advance frame by frame but it's kind of wonky. Check it out. The frame, it says 24, but if I hit the right arrow, it jumps to whatever that is. So we're going to go back. I think that was 26. And as you can see, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, I guess it was 28. It jumped many frames. So this is not a reliable way to check frame by frame. Now you can use the VLC player, all you have to do is right click inside, go to view and advanced controls, and there is a single advanced frame that you could press. However, VLC player is not compatible with most files, including the files that we're going to be using for this demonstration and this analysis. So I have to end up using software like Adobe Premiere Pro or any other video editing software because these have controls built in to do exactly what we want them to do. Step forward one frame at a time, and no matter how fast you click, then you know that you're going to see every single frame on screen. Also, 
doing this shows the advanced frame by frame trick, but it also proves that our source absolutely without a doubt is recording and outputting 4K60 properly. So any frame drops that we're gonna see in any future analysis is not the source. It's only something with the capture setup. Okay, so now that we've proved that without a doubt, this setup outputs 4K60 without dropping frames, I'm gonna be running this into an Avermedia Live Gamer 4K, which is plugged into a StarTech.com PCI by 16 to Thunderbolt adapter, into an Asus motherboard with a Thunderbolt expansion card, an i9 processor, 32 gigs of RAM, and a PCI Express 4.0 NVMe hard drive, one of the ones that's rated at 7,000 megs per second, because that hard drive is required, otherwise it won't be fast enough to keep up with all the frames being drawn. So it is not the fastest machine in the world, but it is no slouch whatsoever, and it is the hardware required to do something like this. According to the Thunderbolt specs, this should be the same as if this card was plugged directly onto the motherboard, but let's see. Okay, to run these tests, I'm gonna be using Virtual Dub 2, and I'm just gonna walk you through the settings that I'm showing here. So I have the capture pin set, so it's RGB 24, 60 frame per second, 3840 by 2160. So this should ensure that it is full uncompressed colors at 4K 60. I'm also gonna to need to use a codec that will support this, and I have tried all of these, and the one that I had the best luck with by far was UT Video. It's not the best codec, but it's the best codec I've found for at least running these tests. And as you can see, there's no conversion required on output, it is just detecting it as full uncompressed colors. Now, the only other thing I'm gonna do is set the capture file to my main OS drive. Normally I wouldn't do that. Normally I would capture to a separate drive, but all of my secondary drives are the half speed of the PCIe 4.0. So instead of 7,000 megs per second, it's three to 3,500. So we're gonna use this uh, directly onto the OS drive. It should not affect the results. Uh, we'll prove that later on, but let's just say uh, Thunderbolt Asus, there we go. So we know that we're in this setup here and I'm just going to hit capture video. So just one thing that you need to know about the examples that I'm gonna be showing here. Right now I'm using OBS and its desktop capture function to talk over what it is I'm showing you in real time. That way I could kind of just have a real time workflow to show how we're doing this. However, you're gonna notice frames inserted, frames dropped, higher CPU usage, and that's because the two capture programs are running at the same time. When I'm showing results of these captures, they're gonna be results of captures that I took after I was done doing the voiceovers. So I'm gonna stop this capture right now. I'm gonna stop OBS in a moment. I'm gonna make sure nothing else is running other than virtual dub, and I'm gonna make sure to get you the best possible capture without anything else skewing the results. But I'm still gonna do the voiceover, so you're gonna see all that stuff in any future examples that I have here. All right, so let's just cycle through a single frame at a time to see what we got. And, oh, here's the first frame dropped right away. Skips 39 and goes directly to 41. But it's very common that I see in these that the first few seconds might have a drop, just because the computer needs to catch up. Maybe the CPU speed was at idle and it needed to be jacked up faster. So let's skip to the end and see what we have here. Uh, I'm just gonna keep cycling. Whoop, there we go. So 49, 51. Let's just keep cycling through and see what we see here because, oh, that's interesting. So 58, no 59, but the frame was doubled. And that's kind of interesting because virtual dub showed zero frames dropped and zero frames duplicated, but we see that here. So that's obviously proof that you can't really go by the VDub numbers. You have to do the analysis yourself. So if we pop the computer open, we could see that there's a few devices connected. The big one would be, of course, the RTX 3060 graphics card. That's gonna be taking up a bunch of lanes. Then there's the Thunderbolt card, and then here's just another older video capture card. So I'm gonna pull these out and run strictly off of the integrated video, just to try to remove any other lanes being taken up. Okay, so as you can see, the only card left plugged in is the Thunderbolt card itself, which is obviously required to do all of this. The graphics card's removed. I left my extra NVMEs in, which 
I would hope doesn't affect it that badly, uh, but at the very least, we're going to need the one to boot off of and write to. So we could always try again if we see a difference, but let's see if this affects it. I know enabling integrated graphics would, of course, end up potentially using up more lanes, but I would assume less than a very fast graphics card. So let's power this up. I have the Thunderbolt stuff still connected. Um, so everything is the exact same. Let's just power it up as is and see if it makes a difference. All right, so here's the same exact analysis that we're doing and let's just keep going through. Oh, there's one missing already. And let's just keep going up to see. So it's about the same. We're already dropping frames. Uh, we're, even though we're using the integrated video and we also have duplicated frames there. So 59, there's no zero, there's two ones skip a four. All right, so that didn't seem to make any difference whatsoever, which was pretty interesting because I was hoping at least more bandwidth would have been freed up by removing the video card, but I guess not. Okay, so now we're just going to be taking the Live Gamer 4K out of this enclosure and just putting it back in the machine as if it was a normal setup. Okay, so now we're just back to a standard setup. The Thunderbolt cart is out, it is not plugged in, in its place is the Live Gamer 4K, and we put the GeForce RTX graphics card back. So now let's run a test and see how it works internally. Okay, so just same exact test as before. Uh, going in, as you see that's selected, it's the same exact capture card, just installed internally. Same settings, same compression codex, no conversion required, and set capture file is the same to the C drive. And let's just call this one direct because it is. And let's see what we get. All right, so here we are again in Premiere. And as you can see, we're just advancing and there isn't a single dropped frame. We could do this all day long. I have before, uh, just for the interest of your own sanity, I'll do another analysis and try to put that in. But as you can see, there are no dropped frames and there were immediately in the other ones that we tested. So if you managed to stick with me after all of those boring tests, you're probably wondering, well, could it possibly be some other component inside this PC that's contributing to the bandwidth issue and not Thunderbolt? And that's exactly what I thought as well. And this is where I dragged my friends from all over in to help. And we did things like verify that the i9 11th gen CPU and 3060 graphics card would be enough to handle all of this, which they definitely are. This is also where we determined that you're going to need a PCI Express 4.0 NVMe that runs at full speed. Otherwise, you won't be able to hit that target 4K60 444 bandwidth. And we even tested the RAM over an entire weekend just to make sure that couldn't be dropping any frames or contributing to it. And that passed with flying colors, which really only left the motherboard. And while I had tested other scenarios and other PCs, none of them were as strictly controlled as the test that I did here. So I figured, okay, maybe it's a motherboard bandwidth limitation. So let me buy a brand new motherboard to try and test. And yes, that's right. I bought an entirely new motherboard just to run these Thunderbolt tests, which brings us to the very short part of shameless self-promotion. If you like what you see here, please consider supporting in any way possible. The monthly support services are what keeps this channel running, but even clicking on affiliate links in the description or just clicking through the general affiliate links on the website and buying the same stuff you were gonna buy anyway at the exact same price is a massive, massive help to keeping this all going. But anyway, let's jump in and verify the results with the brand new motherboard. So I transferred all of the very well tested and thoroughly vetted components over to the brand new motherboard. And all of the specs on this motherboard are pretty much the same, except for one that I thought was very important for this test. The Thunderbolt controller is built onto the motherboard. It's not something that slots into a PCI slot. I figured maybe that was affecting the results somehow, so let's give this a try, but let's start with a control test, the Live Gamer 4K into the PCI slot of the new motherboard. Okay, so just like always, I'm gonna fast forward frame by frame and you can see none of it is missing. Everything is absolutely the way it's supposed to be. So this motherboard is at least equal to the other one and it is not dropping frames at all, regardless of the setup. Okay, so once again, we're simply going to remove the capture card from the motherboard 
and plug it into an external Thunderbolt enclosure, which connects directly to the motherboard's I.O. port. Okay, so let's just do the same test as last time. We'll skip right to the end and see if we have, oh, right off the bat. So 47 to 49, there's two 49s. And let's see what else we got here. Oh, we skipped 57. So this is exactly the same as last time. There's no difference at all. The motherboard made no difference. It was just a waste of money for my own peace of mind. But let's check one more thing out. So since we're here doing all of this, I just wanted to double check and see what about 1440p60. And I've also tested 4K24, 4K30, and all of those worked even at uncompressed colors, but I just wanted to see what about 60 frame per second, 1440p. And as you can see here, it seems to be totally fine. All right, so I have clearly proven that in two separate scenarios, we're getting 4K60 uncompressed capture from the card plugged in internally on the PCI slot, but not externally. And while I didn't show any of this on camera, I used multiple PCI Express to Thunderbolt external adapters. I'll leave links to those in the description. I also used multiple capture cards. I tried this with a $2,500 Datapath card and it was the exact same results. Worked perfectly on the internal side, but not on the external side via Thunderbolt adapters. But I think all the real proof we need is with bigger companies that support Thunderbolt. Because Avermedia, the company that made the Live Gamer 4K that I've been using in these tests, also has the Live Gamer Bolt which is basically the exact same thing, but a Thunderbolt port instead of a PCIe slot. And that software caps that capture card at 4K50 when running uncompressed RGB color space. So that means Avermedia themselves found this bandwidth limitation, but it's not just them. I recently tested a Blackmagic design card that is also Thunderbolt and claims it could do 4K60, but not uncompressed colors. So we now have two huge companies that do this for a living that have found the same limitation that I have, yet Thunderbolt still claims that it has a 40 gigabytes per second bandwidth limit. So that's probably not true. So what do you all think about this? Did I do the testing right? Does somebody else want to verify and make sure that I'm actually doing the right things? I'd love to have my friends Epos Fox, the crew at Digital Foundry, and Linus Tech Tips double check all of this because they have access to a ton more hardware than I do and probably don't have to spend a lot out of pocket to do these tests. Because I'm always the first to admit, maybe I'm missing something. I did my diligence to the extent of my knowledge, but maybe there's just something out there that I don't know about. Maybe I could get some crazy Xeon or, th or Threadripper processor that handles so many more lanes and this bandwidth limitation will disappear. If that's the case, then the marketing for Thunderbolt's technically correct. Or did I get it right? And all of the Thunderbolt marketing is actually false advertising and the speeds are a quarter higher than they actually are in real world practice. And most importantly, does anybody care at all? Because <laughs> honestly, 90, 95% of people that use Thunderbolt will have it do exactly what they need it to do and will never hit the bandwidth limitations at all. So maybe I'm just wasting my time and nobody cares, but I would like to know, what do you all think about this? And is there a scenario I'm not thinking of that would hit the bandwidth limitation? I can only really think about video in and out, but maybe I'm missing something. Either way, I really appreciate your time. Normally I do videos that are focused on the retro gaming and retro display scene, but I also do a lot of crossover stuff like this because all of this stuff affects everybody in the nerd scene, whether it's a retro gamer, a modern great gamer, or whatever else. So if you like this and you want to see more of what I do, please check out the channel and the weekly podcast. But either way, thank you so much for your time, and hopefully I'll see you next time.